Vasily from Moscow University, uh, Russia, uh, and uh, I'll be a chairman on this very session. Uh, and uh, I want to invite uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Miguel Moreno, uh, with uh, different instabilities in dope translators, please. Okay, good morning to everybody. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank to Professor Christophe Dujardin and his team for making possible this nice conference and also for this invitation. Let me tell you, merci beaucoup de votre gentillesse. Now, I am going to focus on the, this uh, talk, which is essentially devoted to a study the structural instabilities in, in DOP insulators. So this talk is essentially the result or is mainly based on the work carried out in true cooperation by a small group during the last 15 days. So let me show you what are the main goals at the present time. <laughs> it's a bit complicated. <laughs> okay. Like, like, okay, thank you. So the main goals are, first of all, to understand the microscopic origin of the structural instabilities, paying special attention to systems with high symmetry, model systems which deal to this high symmetry, uh, allows one to uh, a deep understanding of the phenomena. On the other hand, we want to analyze the reliability, okay, reliability, or simple ideas which are often used in the interpretation of experimental data. For carrying out this talk, we will first of all focus on the analysis of available experimental data performed by different scientists. And in the second part, we show uh, the uh, main results arising from first principle calculations. So, the main question is why we are going to study these instabilities. First of all, because it is an attractive phenomenon, especially when it appears a symmetry breaking. On the other hand, due to this uh, attractive phenomenon, there are some interesting changes of properties. Only to quote one example, for instance, in the, sorry, in the case of a strontium chloride doped with iron plus, who Professor Nistor knows very well, there is a huge magnetic anisotropy associated with the off-center displacement in this case. But it is important to stress that this study is also interesting in the realm of pure compounds. For instance, the ferroelectricity in barium titanate involves an off-center distortion. Also, the stability of the self-trapped hole giving rise to a mobile a small polaron in silver chloride this stability is favored by the Jantler effect, a, a subject deal, in this, deal with in this poster this afternoon. Now, now concerning the main ideas I would like to discuss, there are the following, which is given in this transparency. First of all, it is often assumed that the off-center motion is essentially due or is favored by reducing the impurity size. If the impurity, if the impurity is small, it's easier to move around the lattice. On the other hand, as you can see in the literature, when there is copper to plus as impurity and there is some distortion around it, everybody says it is due to the Jantler effect. Also along this line, it is assumed that the Jantler effect necessarily means a symmetry breaking, and we shall discuss also this idea. And finally, concerning a, 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 an idea which involves a wider character, it is assumed that the properties of transition metal impurities in insulating materials can be understood considering only the complex form by the, the transition metal and the close ions or ligands. Okay. Now, let me start uh, precising which are the three types of instability we are going to discuss in this talk. First of all, 
uh, we are going to consider this lattice, which is a cubic lattice, and RH means the metal ligand distance in the perfect lattice. So when this cation is replaced by an impurity, there are modifications in the local structure. So I am going to consider three types. There are more, of course. First of all, I am going to consider the symmetric distortion, which is indicated here, where what happens is that the symmetry remains, the local symmetry in this case remains cubic, but nevertheless, the metal ligand distance are varied due to the replacement of the host cation by the impurity. On the other case, there is the static Janteler effect, where as, aside from this fact, there is a symmetry lowering. So in this case, the final uh, symmetry is not cubic, but it is uh, tetragonal. And also, I am going to consider the, what is called the off-center motion, where the impurity is not on center, and by this reason, the symmetry is lowered. So in other words, you see that also in the realm of, of uh, insulating lattices, there are some species who, which prefer to move out. OK, so let me start with a uh, um, phenomenological uh, description of the first, uh, the first instability, which is the, the simplest one, the symmetric. So consider, uh, we are going to consider, first of all, the cation of the host lattice. So if uh, I consider the, this breathing mode, and I call Q the coordinate associated to this distortion, so this coordinate is equal to zero when the uh, host cation is at the, the, at, the lat, at, the, at the position in the perfect lattice. So if I move this, uh, the, the, uh, let's say, the, um, the uh, ligands in this, uh, making this breathing mode, what happens is that the energy increases with respect to the uh, initial position, which corresponds to Q equal to zero. Huh? This is the parabola, so very well sampled. But at the moment I replace the host cation by the impurity, what happens is that you know that the, uh, at, this, at this moment there is an inwards or outwards relaxation making that the final Q is different from zero. But this is equivalent to say that at the origin, let's say at Q equal to zero, there is a force making possible this distortion. Mm -hmm. This is a very simple. So let me tell you that a similar situation can also happen in the case of the Janteler effect, the static Janteler effect I'm going to discuss. So imagine that we are going to deal with, with D7 ion, for instance, uh, rhodium 2 plus, Freeling, Professor Freeling knows, knows it very well because he has been working a lot on this ion. And apart from the symmetric distortion, we are going to see that there is another distortion due to the fact that the, it appears a non-symmetric force. Let me explain in some detail. So imagine that the, this seven ion is placed in a cubic lattice like sodium chloride. So in principle, there is a degeneracy. So this electron can be either in this orbital or in the other one, at least at the beginning. Imagine that the, we place the electron in this orbital. So this is the representation of the electronic density, making that this, uh, the electronic density has an axial character. This axial character pushes the, uh, the axial ligands away, favoring, finally, what is an elongated tetragonal distortion. Very simple to understand. But the situation in Janteler is always delicate, because in principle, the electron could be also in this, uh, in this orbital because initially there is a degeneracy. So if it, it, it would be the case, in such a case, we would reach a compressed conformation and the electron would be in this orbital. As Pablo Garcia has told you yesterday, normally elongated geometry is preferred, but not always. So now let me move to the subtleties, subtleties behind the Janteler effect. Don't forget that we have started with this uh, um, cation, which is in a cubic, initially in the cubic situation. So, of course, there is a, it can be an elongation along the z-axis, but also it's also equally probable an elongation uh, uh, 
where, where the principal axis is y or the principal axis is x. So, in principle, you have three equivalent situations, perfectly equivalent situations. Nevertheless, in the nature, what happens is at a given point, one of them, or at a given point of the lattice, one of them is preferred. This is obvious to what is called random strains, which exist in, in any real crystals, not in any ideal crystal. But the crystals are never perfect. So, let me tell you that this is strongly connected with the idea of in homogeneous broadening that it was men mentioned yesterday. Because let's say what it implies is that if I have um, the same impurity in different positions, the, uh, uh, the, situation is, uh, the physical situation is not exactly the same due to these random strains, and this produces the inhomogeneous broadening. So what happens is that in this case, if I apply a magnetic field, I am going to observe three different centers, three different spectra, and this is the fingerprint of the static Janteller effect, at least at the low temperatures. Eh? On the other hand, according to this reasoning, no static Janteller effect would happen in a perfect crystal. So let's see what happens when the crystal is nearly perfect. Okay. Now, I am going to simply to discuss the other instability which concerns the off-center distortion. In this case, you have a fluoride crystal, and you can have some impurities which, instead of being at the center of the cube, they move off-center. Of course, if now if you think about the energy as a function of the theta coordinate, the displacement with respect to the initial position, what happens is that it's very easy to understand the energy it's an, uh, in, is an even function of the theta coordinates. In other words, the change of energy would be the same if I move up, upwards or downwards. So, if, uh, taking into account this fact, as if you develop this function around the theta equal zero, let's say the initial position, you get that there is no force, and by contrast, the first uh, term different from zero is this. So, owing only to this simple reasoning, you realize that when you are dealing with an off-center distortion, the things are, in, in many cases, quite different from the other instabilities. So, there is no force at the initial position, and the only way of obtaining an instability is to assume that the initial position is not a minimum, but a maximum. In other words, the force constant is negative. So, Professor Barestov was talking yesterday about in some cases that the force constants can be negative. So this is the main idea. And this is surprising. But so how the force constant at the initial position in the nice cubic side would be negative. This is the main issue to be understood in these cases. OK, now I am going to provide you some nice examples in order to see that these uh, instabilities take place in the nature. First of all, I am going to consider the, what, the symmetric distortion. And for this um, purpose, I have chosen manganese 2 plus in the floor of perovskites. So the main idea is that if there is a, a symmetric distortion, it means that the metal ligand distance or the impurity ligand distance will, is going to depend on the host lattice. So uh, if the, it is true, we can expect that at least some spectroscopic parameters are sensitive to the actual value of the metal ligand distance. One of these parameters is called a 10DQ, which is very well known in the realm of impurities. And in the case of manganese, roughly speaking, 10DQ is obvious to this difference between the first band and the third band. You see that when you move from the magnesium perovskite to the calcium perovskite, 10DQ decreases significantly, as it is shown here. But the, so we see that there are some parameters which are sensitive to the existence of this uh, symmetric distortion. But let me tell you that there are other parameters which are much less sensitive to this fact. For instance, if you regard the third, the sharp line which is here, is the third uh, optical transition, you see that it remains at the same place in both perovskites. So attention has to be paid because not all parameters are equally sensitive. All these things are discussed in these in this, uh, um, articles. OK, so let me now move to give you some one example 
concerning Jantler effect. In this case, we remain in the in a perovskite lattice, but we are going to replace manganese 2 plus by copper 2 plus. And in this case, there are some uh, APR spectra. And in general, what is observed is that, first of all, you observe three centers. In the case when the magnetic field is parallel to a, one of the principal axes of the cube, two of the centers give this, what is called the perpendicular spectrum. So, if you look at the, at the symmetry of the angular rot, uh, rotation pattern, it is quite clear that each center displaces the tetragonal symmetry. And also, analyzing the G factor, it's quite clear that G parallel is much higher than G perpendicular. And this is an indication that the hole is in this orbital and the octahedron is elongated. So it's a nice example. Now, I am going to move to provide you two examples concerning the off-center distortion. The first of all I have chosen is uh, calcium fluoride doped with nickel. This is a nice example because calcium, the, all the uh, calcium nuclei have a, a spin, nuclear spin, which is equal to zero, and the same thing happens with nickel plus. The dominant isotope has zero. So all the hyperfine interactions which are seen here come from the interaction of the unpired electron, in this case, nickel plus has the same structure as copper 2 plus, with the surrounding, the, the, uh, the nuclear spin of surrounding uh, I, uh, anions. No? So we are going to demonstrate, only looking at the number of lines that are here, you can uh, verify that in this case, the nickel plus moves of center. So what is the reason? So, uh, if it, is, it moves of center in this situation, there are four equivalent, magnetically equivalent nuclei of fluorine surrounding the nickel plus. So each uh, um, uh, nucleus of fluorine has a spin one half. So four multiplied by one half is two. And the number of lines associated would be five, which is exactly what is seen here and seen here. So this is a nice indication of the existence of this off-center. Because if it would be on center, the number of lines making the same resonance would be, instead of five, would be nine. By the same idea, if you replace, in, this, in, in, in a similar case, the ligands, which are fluorine, by chlorine, you would expect 30 lines in the case that uh, the, the system is moved off center. And this is just what is seen in the case of strontium chloride dopers with iron plus, which has been uh, performed by, by uh, Sergio Junistor and also uh, Henry Link. No? You see the very nice spectrum here showing the 13 lines. So let me tell you that in this domain, attention has to be paid to be sure that the off-center motion is not due to other defect or impurity present in the crystal. So, in these cases, it's quite clear that charge compensation has to exist. But let me tell you that in many cases in the literature, charge compensation is, is remote. It means that by the spectroscopic methods, even using Endor, you, see, you, you don't see any defect which can, can be responsible for it. So we have to assume that in this case, the situation involves an spontaneous off-center motion. The, the off-center motion is spontaneous. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to try to give you a, a, an ensemble view of different impurities in crystals which exhibit the same lattice structure, the fluoric structure. So I have indicated uh, the bull modulus of all these lattices and different impurities. So first of all, we are going to analyze the all data provided by different samples. But well, in this table, you see that, okay, nickel plus moves off center in the three lattices. By contrast, copper two plus only moves off center in two lattices, and manganese two plus also always remain on center. Okay, what is the idea? First of all, nickel plus is bigger than copper two plus. Nickel mass is monovalent, copper two plus and manganese two plus are divalent. So, it's, it appears that the biggest cation moves always off center and the smallest cation in some cases no. So attention 
to be paid to the simple view. Okay, uh, Catania's move of center due to, they are very small, the size, no? On the other hand, we can see that uh, even that copper to plus is placed in, in these lattices, not always there is a, a gentle effect. Let's say, in the case of calcium fluoride, copper to plus remains on center, and then there is a gentle effect. But in the other case, there is something new which uh, makes that the copper to plus moves off center. So you have two different channels of instability which are in competition. Also, very interesting, in my opinion, is to look at what happens concerning the different host lattices. So you see that in strontium chloride is much more favorable for obtaining the off-center distortion. And as you can see, uh, sorry, the, off, uh, the strontium chloride is the softest lattice. So in principle, we can say that when you have a, a soft lattice, it's better for obtaining an off-center. Of course, the, exist, the non-existence of manganese of, in, 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 in off-center distortion in the case of manganese 2+, implies that one has to pay attention to the electronic structure. Now, uh, we are going now to, to move to the results of some calculations. Eh? Okay, I am going to focus in the case of copper to plus. And the first thing I would like to stress from the point of view of calculations is that, in fact, the phenomenon is strongly related to the electronic configuration. For achieving this goal, what we have done is the following. The actual configuration for copper to plus in, don't forget that we are under an hexahedral coordination and not in an in a octahedral coordination, is this one. But what we have done in the first step is to consider that the hole is equally sharp among the three T2G levels. When you do the calculations, you realize that in all cases, the stable situation corresponds to zeta equal to zero. So it means there is no off-center distortion. So by contrast, when you consider that the hole is in this orbital, you, re you reproduce the main experimental facts. For instance, copper to plus in calcium fluoride remains off center. In a strontium fluoride, the, there is a small off center distortion, and in a strontium chloride, there's a huge, huge uh, off center displacement. Hmm? We can say that main experimental trends are those reproduced. Now, let me move to the other case we are going to deal with, which corresponds to iron plus in strontium chloride. So you see that if the calculations, first of all, you see that the force at the initial position is zero, as, as we have said before. But the minimum is located, as you can see, practically 1.3 angstroms. So the excursion implies a very big motion. The stabilization energy, as it's pointed out, is only 0.3. So this kind of thing implies teeny change of energy. I mean, a change of energy of the order of 0.1 electron volt. So attention has to be paid because all those things are subtle. So bearing in mind these facts, you realize also that here, the curvature here is negative. It means that the force constant is negative, in fact. So this is the main question when you have and of center distortion. And the question is, sorry, could you explain me what is the origin of a force constant which is negative? Because just at the position of the uh, initial position, which is cubic, is very nice. Why to obtain then a force constant which is negative? So this is the main thing that we have to explain. OK. So I would like now to stress that this kind of things cannot be explained by simple models which treat the ions uh, as, they, as, as if they are rigid spheres. This is the case of this well-known Bormeyer model, for instance. And if you calculate the force constant, you see that the force constant, of course, decreases as far as the uh, distance increases, but it's hard to, to obtain with this model a force constant which is negative. So this means that you have to, to come back to the main principles of physics, and in the microscopic world, this means quantum mechanics. Otherwise, you don't understand anything. So we are going to start remembering what happens in quantum mechanics. Normally, many people say, oh, uh, 
at the moment I have a, a molecule or a, a, or a solid, the most important thing is I consider that the, nucle the nuclei are fixed. And if they are fixed, then I can speak about symmetry. What is the idea? For instance, in this case, which is a simpler square, if I have an electron in this position, I rotate the electron 90 degrees, and the electron sees the same landscape. We say that 90 degrees belongs to the symmetry group of this case. Okay, but I am only rotating the electron because the nuclei are fixed. But unfortunately, what now uh, in, the, in, the, in the present case, I have to take into account the possible existence of this Q coordinate. I am going to discuss the existence of distortions, so motions of the nuclei around the initial position. So I am going only to consider this first term. This corresponds to the uh, the frozen nuclei, and I'm going to consider the linear term. This, this term is called the electron vibration coupling, appears in a lot of problems in physics. This electron vibration coupling, for instance, is responsible for the resistivity in metals and semiconductors. Okay, now we are going to, to see that it also plays a key role for understanding most of the things we are dealing with. But the problem is how to extend the idea of symmetry, because in this case, we are, it seems that logic to operate on both the electronic and the Q. So in this case, what we have to consider is that Q is also a variable. OK, so this can be uh, underst uh, understood easily. In this case, I am going to distort the, uh, the initial square, making a rhombus, of course, if I am in this position, the initial position, and I rotate only the electron, I never find the same, any, uh, the, same situa the same physical situation. But if at the same time I rotate the electron, I also do rotate the, the distortion, I, I get a situation which is physically equivalent. So I have to apply the symmetry operation on both electronic and Q variables and distortion coordinates. So furthermore, when I have these kind of things, it can be seen that cubic symmetry is preserved provided that both this quantity, which is involves the electron coordinates, transform in the same way as the other quantity. So now we are going to see what is the role of this linear electron vibration coupling on different instabilities. OK. So let me start by the symmetric distortion. And in the case of the symmetric distortion, we are going to, it's very simple. This is the, the frozen Hamiltonian. This is the electron lattice coupling. So we have seen that when I induce an impurity, there is a force. And the force is very simple to see that is related to the expected value of this operator just as the initial position. Phi zero is the, 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 the wave function of the initial position in this point. So it's very simple. So the force, as it is uh, indicated here, is determined by the ground state electronic density at the cubic site in first order approximation. Now let me now move to the Jantelier effect. I, you, you will see that there is some, uh, some similarities. It's not exact, but there are a lot of similarities with this situation. So for clarifying this issue, I think it's important to re remind you that in the Jantelier effect, the the mode, the distortion mode, is, the, is also degenerate in this case. No? These are the two components. This is the Q theta that we have up to now we have seen, but there is the, also the Q epsilon. Combining both coordinates, you can get the three different situations which are physically equivalent in the absence of random strains. So writing Q theta and Q epsilon in polar coordinates, the, the three different uh, equivalent situations are described by the angles which are indicated in this transparency. Now, let me now move to the case of the D7 ion, and we are going to see, we are, we are going to uh, assume that in this case the electron is located in the Z orbital, and we can write similarly to what we have seen in the case of the uh, symmetric distortion that the linear electron vibration coupling involves the two Q theta and Q epsilon coordinates in, in a way that V, v theta transform like Q theta and so on. So if C0 is this, corresponds to the initial wave function at the, uh, at the cubic site, the force 
is, uh, is given by this quantity. So it's very similar to what happens in the case. So using the same ideas, we can now move to the case of the off-center displacement. In the case of the off-center displacement, pay attention because in this case, the distortion mode, which is uh, uh, transformed by x, i, or z, involves a, a, a mode which is not even, but odd. So when you are, if Vx transform like x and so on, when you are going to calculate the force, it's obvious that it's uh, electronic density. Eh? The electronic density remains. So I am going to approach these core electrons to this one, and normally this produces a force which is against the distortion. But nevertheless, if now I allow to the, these electrons to this electronic density to move to the middle part, this gives rise to a force which is, goes, which is favorable to the distortion. This is the origin of the, the situation I have mentioned. So in principle, you have two contributions. So in some cases, the sum of this is positive, and so the situation is usual. But in other cases, the, the total force becomes negative, and the off-center distortion is taking place. Mm? So maybe it's uh, interesting to analyze these kind of things, which are important, from a, another point of view. You, everybody knows that in, when you are dealing with a transition metal complex, you have some 3D antibonding orbitals, uh, in the sense that these orbitals are partially filled. Eh? By contrast, you have also the bonding orbitals, which are mainly ligand, which are filled. So imagine that at zeta equal to zero, let's say at the initial position, one is even and the other is odd. But at the moment I switch on the distortion, I move to set for symmetry, and in some cases, this orbital and this one transform in the same way. So in such a case, what happens is there is a repulsion between these orbitals. So the lowest decreases the energy, and the higher increases its energy. But Please pay attention because here I have uh, one electron, or let's say the, the, the shell is not filled, and well, in this case, this, the shell is filled. So if you, when you realize there is a net gain of energy, this is the, uh, this is the basis for the uh, off-center distortion. So this is quite important that this is, this is related to the different population between bonding ligands bonding ligand levels and the antibonding orbitals. Now, I am going to, um, so the, I am going to remark one thing. This means that when you are dealing with copper, manganese, and so on, uh, the, a, a, a very important thing is the separation between the antibonding and bonding ligand levels. This is experimentally seen in the in spectroscopy uh, through the charge transfer transition. What happens with charge transfer transition? So these are the results obtained by several years ago by Simonetti and McClure concerning different ions in lithium chloride. OK, in lithium chloride, there is no off-center, no problem. All the remain on center. But what is seen here is that the, if you have, if you start with copper 2 plus, the charge transfer transition is around 25 wave numbers. If you go to manganese, the charge transfer transition is 60 wave numbers. So the, the situation is completely different. So it means that copper 2 plus is more favorable than manganese 2 plus to obtain a, a, an off center distortion, such as we have seen before. Eh? And what is the final reason of it? So is, it is, this situation is strongly related to the ionization potential of uh, free ions. The ionization potential of copper 2 plus is much higher than the ionization potential of manganese 2 plus. Mm -hmm. Now, but I, and now I would like to, to make a point concerning monovalent ions. Mm -hmm. So we have seen that uh, nickel plus moves off center. Also, we have seen copper plus moves also very easily off center. And also, we will see, we'll talk about manganese plus. Okay. In such a case, let me tell you that the situation is a bit different. In these cases, the separation between the 3D orbitals and the 
mainly legal levels is much higher. I give you some, some figures eh, in the next transparency. But nevertheless, they are closer to 4P, 4P levels. These 4P levels have also, an, uh, also involved an odd parity. Eh? So what happens is that in this case, the situation when you are dealing with this singular monovalent ions is that the interaction between 3D levels and 4P levels plays an important role for understanding the final situation, the, the final geometry. Eh? OK. Now, I am going to give you these results. I am, uh, here it's compared what happens for copper 2 plus and nickel plus. Eh? The results, the figures are given here. So for copper 2 plus, charge transfer are around 3 electron volts. 3D 4P is around 10 electron volts. And the opposite happens in the case of the nickel plus. So the situation, as it is depicted here, is different. So in order to see the importance of the 3D 4P excitations in the case of monovalent ions, let me show you some, uh, some uh, interesting features. First of all, I have given here the value of 3D 4P excitation uh, for different ions. Eh? You see that all of them are in the ultraviolet region, but nevertheless, it's important to see that in the cases where this transition has been measured, there is a, a negative shift. So they move to lower energy when the uh, ion is in a lattice. So in order to, to uh, support the idea that the 3D 4P excitations play a key role for understanding the off-center distortion in the case of monovalent ions, it's interesting that in this case, we have made a curious um, calculation. So this is the result with uh, 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 extended Huckel calculations is not, has not a very good reputation, but anyway, it's possible to them to extract some interesting features. And you see that in the normal calculation, you get that there is a minimum, there is an off center and so on. But at the moment you remove from the basis set the four orbitals, this, this effect disappears. So this is one uh, important issue supporting that the 3D 4P excitation play a key role in these singular monovalent ions. Okay. Now, maybe we are at, at the present time, we can uh, give a, a, a general view about the conditions for observing an off-center motion. First of all, we can say that concerning the host lattice, it's better to use soft lattices than hard lattices in a series of isomorphous systems. For this reason, a strontium chloride is better for this purpose than calcium fluoride. Also, it's important to say that at the moment you apply a pressure, uh, you are going to reduce distances and uh, also you are going to increase the force constants. And for this reason, normally pressure acts against the existence of an off-center distortion, a situation which experimentally has been well seen in this system. On the other hand, concerning the impurity complex, it's well known that in general, the force constants increase, increases with the nominal charge of the metal. You know? Normally, monovalent ions, which involves bigger metal ligand distance, uh, exhibit uh, a smaller force constant. So it's easier to, uh, to at the final situation to obtain a force constant which is, becomes negative. At the moment you start from force constants which are very huge, it's very difficult to get a force constant which is negative. And for this reason, for instance, chromium 3 plus is very reluctant to move off center. Eh? We are going to see that monovalanins are good. Divalan in some cases, chromium 3 plus, as far as I know, I have never seen that it moves off center. And on the other hand, we have seen that the electronic structure is also important. It's quite, in this sense, it's important to have close excited states that in principle favor the distortion. For this reason, copper 2 plus is fi more favorable than manganese 2 plus, and also open shell cations like nickel plus and also copper plus are better than, uh, than cations like uh, sodium or potassium plus, which can be considered at closed shell. Now, uh, we are going to see whether these ideas can be useful for understanding other systems. And now, for this, in this case, I am going to move to systems with rock salt structure. 
this is a collection of experimental results. And you see that uh, we are going to compare sodium chloride with potassium chloride. Please pay attention because the bull modulus of sodium chloride is about 50% higher than in the case of potassium chloride. You see that all the impurities in the sodium chloride, the impurities which are indicated in this transparency, remain on center. But nevertheless, when you move, you move to potassium chloride, the three monovalent move off center. Only the monovalent, not the divalent. Okay. Now, along this line, I would like now to discuss what happens in cubic oxides, like magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, and strontium oxide. So for this goal, but oh, sorry. I would like now, before going on this subject, I would like to underline a very important thing. So it's quite important to understand the meaning of this uh, quantity when the force constant is negative. This means that, in principle, taking into account that this is isotropic, uh, if the, the force constant is negative, the off-center situation is uh, stable for every direction. This is what is uh, observed here. And when you do the calculations, in this case, it's quite clear that the, uh, the, the, the final situation the, the motion would be along 1, 1, 1. But for understanding it, it requires to study the bonding in the final state. But in principle, all the, in all the distortion can happen in every direction. Now, let me move to this, to this uh, thing. So th these are the results carried out, theoretical results carried out on different cations, moving simply the cation in, this, uh, in, in a lattice with rock salt structure. These are magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, and strontium oxide. You see that in all those cases, the, the force constant decreases, but nevertheless, in titanium and chromium, the force constant, even in strontium oxide, is very huge. Even also in manganese 2 plus, the force constant is smaller, but nevertheless, it's positive, as, and also the same thing in sodium. Nevertheless, when we move to other ions, like uh, as shown here, uh, so copper and nickel plus, move of center only in strontium oxide and also nickel plus. The case of nickel plus in calcium oxide has been discussed yesterday by Pablo, so it, it is uh, on center, but it's close to the, the off center instability. Okay, so you see that the, this idea uh, support that the, if you want to um, take an off center distortion, it's better to, to use to, to deal with soft lattices. Okay, now, but this is a question. We have seen uh, in this transparency that titanium is very difficult to move off center. But nevertheless, one can say, sorry, but in barium titanate, titanium moves off center. So, could you explain me this? So, the, uh, now you are going to see the importance of making calculations out of the equilibrium situation. So, for clarifying this relevant issue, what we have done is to consider the following. Uh, calculation. In baryon titanate, you try to move only one titanium 4 plus of center. And the force constant is highly positive. So it's, of course, this is not possible. By contrast, when you move at the same time all the titanium, the force constant is slightly negative, explaining the existence of electricity in titanium, in baryon titanate. So it's, uh, this result implies that the uh, the, the existence of electricity in barium titanate obeys to a cooperative effect. And for this reason, the ferroelectricity is suppressed at the moment you decrease the size of the sample. So please pay attention because uh, our, our thought it is, uh, in, the, in this situation seems to be related to the off center in impurities. The local mechanism is not able to produce the off center in the, in the barium titanate. So it's a very important point. Okay, now let me move to the, uh, to the final part of this talk. And we are going to explore this question. Uh, uh, we are going to see whether copper in octahedral coordination, people think that there is always a John Teller effect. On the other hand, we are going to see, to explore the other question, can everything be understood considering the complex formed by the impurity and the ligands? For clarifying this relevant issue, I think it's quite nice to consider this example. We are going to compare 
uh, uh, the cubic perovskite, which is indicated here, in, in which zinc is going to be replaced by copper with this layered perovskite, where also zinc 2 plus is replaced by copper. Let me uh, stress that in both cases, the, uh, in this case, the octahedron is the surrounding zinc 2 plus is perfect. And in this case, it's nearly perfect. Yeah? So in principle, with the sample ideas, one say, OK, no problem. The response is going to be practically the same in, bo in both cases. Well, let's analyze what the experimental results say. So first of all, we have seen uh, this uh, system. We have already seen that in this case, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, in this case, three centers uh, are observed. We are dealing with a, a true Janteller effect. The hole is in this uh, uh, orbital, and the octahedron is elongated. Let me only tell you that in this situation, if you, we are going to discuss in the next transparencies the optical transitions, we expect three optical transitions, and we have paid special attention to the lowest one. Hmm? But now, let me show you what are this, the APR results concerning the layered perovskite. In this case, only Surprisingly, only one center is observed. No, three, only. Let's say all the copper ions in this are fully equivalent. And the main axis is precisely the C axis of this tetragonal structure. This is the first surprise. Secondly, as you can see <laughs> by the G tensor, indicates that the hole is in a different orbital. Other surprise. And then, of course, it seems that the octahedron is not elongated by compression. So it's a very puzzling situation. So it's necessary to understand it, what happens. So uh, concerning the optical spectrum, there are also surprises. I have shown here what happens in the case of the, per the normal perovskite. Two transitions have been found above 4,000 wave numbers. And the, it means that the lowest one should be below 4,000 uh, wave numbers. Eh? What happens by contrast in this case is that the lowest band is about 5,000 wave numbers, much higher. So maybe it indicates that the distortion in this case is much higher than in this one. So, but you see that there are su very surprising results. Okay, now if we move to the calculations and we start with the case of the perovskite, the pure perovskite, uh, the calculations have been done placed in the electron in Z square and also in this orbital, and you see that the uh, more stable situation corresponds to this one, and then, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, octahedron is elongated. Please pay attention, nevertheless, that the separation between both quantities is only 8 milli electron volts. So in many cases, the gentleman is very subtle because in many cases, this quantity can be uh, very small. In other cases, in, instead, of, as we have seen yesterday, <coughs> the, this, uh, uh, the situ this situation is more stable than the other one, and the, uh, the, the, the complex is compressed. Now, we are going to see what, uh, uh, say, these calculations concerning the DD transition. Well, the DD transitions are reasonably reproduced, and especially it's important to notice that they calculate the first uh, transition is well uh, below 4,000 uh, wave numbers at, at, uh, uh, in, in agreement with experimental data. But uh, now let me move to the case of the um, layer perovskite. In the case of the layer perovskite, you see that, of okay, course, it is, uh, we obtain that the situation is compressed along the C axis. Please pay attention because practically the only variable, the only the distance we change from the pure lattice is the axial, not the equatorial. Eh? What is surprising to see is that if you put here the, the, this quantity, which essentially reflects the tetragonality, is higher the, the, than the normal perovskite than for the layer perovskite. So by contrast, we have seen that the, this uh, transition is smaller for the, layer, for the normal perovskite and for the layer perovskite. So it's difficult to understand. So what is the reason of the, uh, everything? So I think that, again, the calculations done out of the equilibrium can 
um, can shed uh, light on this curious situation. So in the case of this layered perovskite, what we, uh, we find is that even if we uh, uh, make that the octahedron surrounding copper to plus is perfect, the, the two distances are equal, there is a, an important gap between these orbitals. And the zeta square orbital is lying above. So even in this situation, if you are going to put your unpaired electron or your hole, you are going to put in it, in the zeta square. When you see what happens at the right equilibrium geometry, this gap is, uh, increases, of course, but let's say practically half the gap exists already in this situation. So it is difficult to understand how the, the, the octahedron is perfect and there is a gap. So I don't understand anything. So uh, what, have we, what we have to do is to revise everything from the beginning. And every no, everybody knows, since the work by Walter Kohn, that in any, the fingerprint of an insulated state is that electrons are localized. So when we are dealing with the transition metal impurity, it means that active electrons are localized in the complex. But nevertheless, the complex is not isolated. It is embedded in a, in, a, in a lattice which is made of ions. Ions are charged, and a charge creates an electric field. So in principle, one, one has to think that the active electrons residing in this complex can also feel the internal electric field generated by the rest of ions. So the main idea is that if you want to understand the thing, you have to consider this corresponding to the free complex or to the isolated complex, and you have to add the electrostatic potential generated this electric field. So in this case, this, uh, the things can be reasonably well understood uh, when you depict the electrostatic energy felt by an electron due to this electrostatic potential. Please pay attention that when you move along the z-axis, 0, 0, 1, this increases the energy, while when you are moving in 100, this, there is an increase of energy. Please pay attention that in a lattice, the divalent cations, positive divalent cations, sin cations, are located in the, in the plane of the layer, while the, uh, the monovalent cations are located along the z-axis. So, owing to this fact, it's easy to understand if you consider the existence of this electric field, this electric field is going to increase the energy of the zeta square, making the hole in this position. So it explains that even if the axial and equatorial distance are equal, nevertheless there is a splitting between uh, these orbitals. So in other words, even at the beginning, let's say even when these uh, two metal ligand distance are equal, the system is filling a day for h symmetry because the host lattice in, uh, has an internal electric field of this symmetry. So this is the key of all we, we are seeing here. Okay, so now we can understand what is the relaxation in this case. So it is, in principle, it's very simple because you have, initially you have the hole put in this direction due to the existence of this internal electric field. At the moment that you have a hole which is a positive, it attracts the two. Oh, sorry. It attracts the two. Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. The two ligands placed along the C-axis. And what happens in this case, uh, the relaxation involves an axial A1G symmetry only. And nothing happens in the plane because the plane is much harder elastically than along the z-axis. Okay. But now we have learned a very important thing. When we are going to consider the properties of a given impurity in an insulated lattice, I have to consider the influence of this elect ele internal electric field. And this is going to play a very important role in other domains. For instance, uh, I am going to, to give you only an example uh, concerning the uh, gemstones made by chromium 3 plus. Well, the main idea is that at the moment I am going to, to uh, study a complex embedded in a lattice, there is, of course, a, 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 a given transition. There is a contribution of what is called intrinsic contribution, 
considering only this isolated complex. But at the moment I add the uh, influence of this internal electric field, this transition is also influenced by this electric field. So the transition energy involves two contributions, the internal and the, the, in, the intrinsic, sorry, and the extrinsic contribution coming from this internal. So owing to this fact, we can understand, for instance, this case, which is the difference between ruby and emerald. It is not due to a different metal ligand distance. It's the same in both cases. But nevertheless, there is an extrinsic contribution in the case of ruby and practically zero in the case of emerald. By the same reason, if you consider the emerald compared to magnesium oxide doped with chromium, the metal ligand distance is different, is higher in this case of course, but nevertheless, the final 10 EQ is the same because there is an extrinsic contribution in this case. Let me tell you that in other cases with lower symmetry, the extrinsic contributions plays a key role for understanding things. So this is especially important, for instance, in the case of the of the Egyptian blue pigment. This pigment is the first uh, uh, artificial pigment made by the human being, which appears in, uh, it is related to the Egyptian culture. And for understanding the, the color, it is quite important to see that there is a big extinction shift of one electron volt for understanding why the color is precisely blue. Now, I am going to finish uh, with... <laughs> One minute, please, if possible, uh, 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 dealing with this pro problem. We have said that a true gentle effect necessarily means a symmetric, symmetric breaking. It is admitted in every case. We have seen that, in principle, in, if we have a perfect uh, D9 ion in a cubic lattice, there are three equivalent situations. Nevertheless, when I move through a normal lattice with random strains, one of them is preferred. So, the existence of uh, a symmetry breaking is favored by the existence of a barrier, and this barrier increases as far as the, uh, the ligands are softer. And the moment that the, the barrier increases, okay, the three wells are not uh, connected, and you, you have the static Janteler effect. So in, in the cases that we have investigated, a static Janteler effect appears when the barrier lies between six, uh, roughly speaking, six milli electron volt and 150. But what happens when the barrier de decreases? And in such a case, the barrier decreases when you have a very hard lattice. So what happens is that in this case, there is tunneling between the three positions. So in such a case, the, uh, the wave functions involves what is called a coherent tunneling. In such a case, you, when you do the APR experiments, you discover not a, a tetragonal symmetry, but a cubic symmetry. So in, in other words, in this case, uh, when the barrier is very small, even that there are some random strains, the, the, the coherent tunneling is able to overcome the existence of these, uh, of these random strains. And so you discover that the, the system is cubic. And if you have a perfect crystal, you always observe this kind of APR experiments dealing with cubic symmetry, not tetragonal symmetry. So this has been observed, it is, which is called a dynamic Janteler effect in the sense, in the sense uh, coined by Franham. This has been observed for uh, D9 impurities in top MGO. So for finishing, uh, I am going to only to put here the main conclusions and then don't forget that true understanding is not often simple because nature is subtle. So in this special moment, let me thank all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your uh, nice and uh, clear presentation. Uh, thank you. We have uh, a time for only one extremely short question. Thank you very much.